Okay. Hello and welcome to another edition of Sigilant's weekly Q&A where your questions are answered by the experts. My name is Joe Murphy and today I'm joined by Dr. Ben Harrison who is the Director of Security Operations Center and Security Services at Sigilant. So Ben runs our SOC and is heavily involved in everything to do with our processes around security services and delivering quality customer value to our customers day in and day out. As always, welcome to the webinar. Ben, how are you doing today? Very well. So it's been a long week, but uh, I think that's the, same, that's the same for everybody, 13 weeks into a global quarantine. So, yeah. yeah, before we kick this off, Ben and I were talking about um, how our hair is just growing out of control. It took me about half a tub of pomade to get this thing to look presentable for you guys. So, so yeah, we're, uh, we're excited to get our haircuts, to say the least. So, so my, my hair will never be presentable, hence I go with the traditional security peaked black cap. So. I do love that cap. That's the signature Ben, ben Harrison cap there. All right. So folks, today the topic of conversation is going to be around SOC. So primarily focused on the Security Operations Center. You know, uh, what does it entail? How does it benefit you? You know, how, how do you justify the cost of partnering with a SOC as a service provider? All of these will be addressed over the course of the next 30 to 45 minutes. As always, this is an open Q&A, so feel free to take advantage of the chat, submit your questions, and we'll do our best to get them all answered. As always, everyone who's in attendance today will receive a copy of the recording after the webinar. So Ben, let's dive right into it. First things first, security monitoring is the main capability one of the main capabilities behind a security operations center. So eyes on glass, you have to be watching for malicious activity. Um, what, so, I mean, security monitoring can mean a couple different things. Yeah. What does it mean to you, Ben, and to us at Sigma? Well, I've, I've started using a lot of anecdotes lately, and I'm not sure what caused that. Maybe again, it's been locked in the house, but um, to me, security monitoring is critical because if no one hears your house alarm or your car alarm go off, what's the point in having one? They're really, you're not getting any value from having it. And it comes down to, I mean, I think we've all walked past that automobile, which is sitting on the parking lot, whose alarm's been going off for three hours. No one's bad at dialing. And that, that's the example of installing security tools without a system for monitoring in place. When the alarm goes off, someone needs to be watching and someone needs to react. If nobody was watching, you can't react. You'll never know. And so security monitoring is literally proactive monitoring of your security environment, your tools, your systems, and everything that in, that entails to find out and see if there are problems. And that, that, that's the proactive element. You're looking for problems in your environment, which have been alerted by your security systems. A secondary part to security monitoring, which is often forgotten, is you also have to keep the system healthy. So if you just install the tools, get them working on day one with the contractor or with, with the consultant, and then they walk away and you just deal with whatever comes out of the machine, it's very likely that your environment will change, attacker behavior will change, you'll find new ways of being attacked and attackers will find new ways of attacking you and you need to keep the system healthy. Again, like your automobile, otherwise if it starts to break and maybe two of the door sensors don't work anymore, it won't work whenever something happens. So th there's two parts, there's the monitoring activity and then there's the health. There's the health checks, there's the continual improvement and continual maintenance of that system. So those two go hand in hand and that's where, to me that is security monitoring, that's it. Mm -hmm. Preventative maintenance. Critical part of it. There is no such thing as done in the world of security. And right. uh, it's, we talked in one of our earlier webinars about confusion of security as, a, as an almost an agile engineering type activity. And the reality is that there is no done. There's no min minimum viable product. Part of a core aspect of all security monitoring and all security certification is the, is the factor of continual improvement because your attackers will continually improve because your environment will continually change and you must keep up. Absolutely. Every single day, I mean, how many vulnerabilities are released into the wild? At least a couple hundred, right? I stopped counting. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and that is going to lead us into our next topic then here. So a lot of people, you know, security is a journey, right? So we're, 
everyone starts at a different point. You know, they all have different tool sets and different structures of their team and, and their environments. No yeah. environment is the same. So some people, they'll run vulnerability scans or they have a vulnerability management program and they assume that if they're plugging all of their holes and vulnerabilities, then they're, they're automatically secure. But, you know, that's not to be confused with security monitoring by any means. No. So what's the difference? So vulnerability management, uh, I need to be clear as well, if we can separate out vulnerability management from patch management. Yeah. And those two, those two are separate. Now, often tools will combine them, but they're two separate activities. Yeah. Vulnerability management is about knowing what you're vulnerable to so that you're in a position to manage those risks. It is not about being immune to everything. And that's a, a mistake which can be made in the security and it can be made by anyone in the security field. If your objective is 100% bulletproof security, uh, most organizations are not capable of that. And that, that, that's okay, that, that's okay. All that you're aiming to do is reduce your risk to the level that you're comfortable accepting. And that's, that's the case. So vulnerability management specifically is about knowing two things. Number one is what is in your environment? And if I can almost split that out again, there are entire software packages designed for asset management. What do I actually have running? Now you may think, let's take it to the smallest of the small. Let's take a startup company. You've got five laptops, you've got a printer, you've got a NAS drive, you've got a router. Well, that's easy. You've just a handful of devices. You can physically see them all sitting in your, in your, in your, in your shared office. So you don't really need asset management at that point. But as you start to scale, you have remote offices, you have people working from home. Can anyone remember what happened to that laptop from two years ago that had the very important? That's what starts to happen. So asset management comes down to discovering what is actually on your network, what assets you have, and then what software they are running. Because that laptop that was the, the laptop that was used to program the cards for the access control system around your factory floor, and it's pulled out of the cupboard whenever a new employee comes in, HR use it, no one looks at it. But you might then find out that that actually has a piece of vulnerability software in it. And it's been there for three years. They never patch it, they never update it. It's not sitting on the network. It's only whenever they take it out as part of an employee onboarding. That has to, you have to be aware of that. You have to know that exists. So the first part of that asset management comes in. And then vulnerability management is literally just taking a list of all of your assets, physical hardware, and all of the software that is running on them and hashing that against all of the known vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is vulnerability management. And at the end of it, you'll have a very long list of here are all the things you're vulnerable to. And at that point, you're starting to look for top 10, top five. What is it you can do this week to drop that down? But vulnerability management in itself, all that does is give you a list of alerts. All it does is tell you, hey, you've got a brand new alert. For example, I mean, we saw a Windows 10 vulnerability in the past week. All it will do is tell you you have it. it, doesn't do anything about it. And back to my first point, all it does is tell you, well, you have this vulnerability. If no one's listening to that alert, no one's going to do anything about it. So that all feeds back into security monitoring. Um, the, way, the way I try and think of it is, I mean, security is a tapestry. It's like trying to paint your wall. You can walk up to it and paint a tiny bit of it with vulnerability management and another bit with asset management. But overall, security monitoring is about monitoring everything in your environment. Vulnerability management, asset management, patch management, and all of those things can provide valuable security alerts. So if your vulnerability management says, I am now vulnerable to 100 more things, or Windows 10 has a vulnerability, we actually have 27 machines that haven't been patched this week, they're all vulnerable. That's something that your monitoring service picks up on and then can go and alert you about and do something about. But your patch management likewise can receive alerts as well. It can say, hey, we tried to patch these three machines and they failed. All the rest succeeded, but you've three failures here. Not sure why someone needs to investigate. And again, if no one reads that alert, you've got three machines that are unpatched. You think you've done it, you think you've tried it, but uh, they're still sitting out there vulnerable. So real difference is vulnerability management is, is knowing what is out there, knowing your risk. Security monitoring is, is being alerted and actually finding out and knowing, having someone watching whenever that risk is highlighted. And that separates the two. Yeah. <clears throat> so... And I want to allude to this a little bit, what, what you said earlier about, you know, how the vulnerability management technology produces an alert, the patch management technology produces an alert. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the security monitoring function, I look at it as the nucleus or like you know, the, the central brain of a security program. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if, if you're feeding so many different types of logs into that, 
I can envision it getting pretty noisy. Um, so I wanted to I wanted to touch on something uh, that you're familiar with, Ben. It's alert fatigue or you know just, just information overload. And we have sure. an individual with us today who was you know dealing with with those challenges. And um, I wanted to raise it to you and and um, just let us talk about it a little bit because I'm sure this individual <laughs> isn't alone with uh, yeah. with the the influx of alerts and and all that fun stuff that comes sure. your way. I mean, sure. I don't know how you can keep up. <laughs> Well, to give an idea of numbers, um, in, my, in my career, I've worked in different scales of environment, and I'm, it, it's not unfamiliar for me to be seeing 35, 40,000 alerts a day wow. in, in, cer in certain sectors in certain environments. Now, when it, when it comes down to what size of sector is, that, that, that's an enormous sector, that's an enormous organization, and that's across a global infrastructure. Now, that's, that's, a, that, that's kind of normal for them. But what, what we need to do is we need to understand that security monitoring is a proactive activity. Someone, a person, is sitting there monitoring what's coming in. If you create snow blindness in that individual, then anything that was useful will get lost in the noise. And if you don't prioritize those, then again, that individual will lose any valuable things in the background. They'll never get as far enough down the list. <clears throat> so security monitoring is a balancing exercise. We need on one hand, to have enough alerts in place that will give us an indicator when something is bad, when there is a problem, when something has gone wrong, when someone has hacked you and been successful. If we turn the volume of those alerts down too much, then we won't see enough footprints to realize that we have an attacker in the system. Mm -hmm. But if we turn it up too loud, then the actual footprints will get lost in the noise. And this is, I was preparing a slide for which I'll be, I'll be presenting to uh, some of our colleagues next week, which effectively talks about we have a volume control and we need to balance that volume very, very carefully. So to avoid fatigue, the only way to do it is make sure that the number of alerts are, is low enough to manage, given the resources you have, and high enough to detect the footprints of attackers or malicious behavior or policy violations, et cetera. Now that, that, that's the high level of a dig. I'm gonna go into a bit of detail and. As you know, I like to talk, so feel free to tell me to stop talking at any point. But no, this is important for yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I get it. I, and the, the, de the detail here is critical. So if you ask what what is it we can do to manage that level of alerts? I mean, what I, I'm, I'm talking hypothetically a volume knob here, but what can we actually do? Now, there's some things that make the alerts go up that we can do nothing about. And quick nod to those: attacker behavior. We cannot control what attackers on the internet are doing. We really can't. So if they decide that it's um, uh, public holidays, let's say it's uh, Martin Luther King Day, and they decide we're going to go just on a mass campaign on this day whenever lots of people are on leave on PTO, and we're going to do it as a burnout exercise to hide an attack on somebody, we can't stop that. We don't, we don't, we don't generally know what's going to happen. Now, some intelligence gathering can give you indicators of this, but I mean, that, that, that's quite in-depth in terms of a security program. So we don't know what's going to happen. Just so suddenly one day, there's twice the number of alerts. So that's something we can't control. The next thing from a security perspective we can't control is we can't really control user behavior. Mm -hmm. And I'll give an example from some of our customers experience, um, a well-known time of the year in the, uh, in the colleges, the universities, the educational authorities is around about the start of term and the start of every semester where over the summer, um, everyone's been away. And this includes academic staff and, and students. They've all been away and they come back having forgotten their passwords because they haven't typed them in in two months. And so within the course of a couple of weeks, most of our customer base who is in the academic sector has a two to three fold increase in failed passwords and logins. We can't control that. Take it a, take it a wee bit further. We also can't control things like um, updates to tools and systems. So we monitor and integrate to a lot of other partner pieces of software. And let's say uh, McAfee decides to upgrade its detection to suddenly create 10 times more alerts. Now you're a good internet citizen and you've got your stuff patched, meaning you get their immediate update and you'll see it by the same time we see it. And suddenly you're now generating twice as many alerts. So all of the things in the system are kind of pushing this number up. I talked right at the beginning about splitting SOC monitoring, proactively looking at the alerts. But on the other hand, it's turning that volume down it's making sure to balance that off and making sure to keep customers healthy and the environment's healthy. And so th those are the main ones that drive up the numbers. Um, other ones that drive it down then, uh, security hardware breaking. If, you're, if your collectors for all of your data just breaks, and out of a huge environment, you might have a thousand different log points 
being mm -hmm. collected of data. And those different points in your network, two of them fall over. You won't notice overall, you might not notice a 2% or a 3% drop, but you're missing vital security information. So those things can start to come down through problems in your network. Where unfortunately we come in then with our health checks is we'll find those and then we go and turn them back on, which pushes our volume back up. As you expand your network infrastructure, as you add more things, you have more alerts coming in. And all of that in terms of change isn't a bad thing, it's just natural evolution. So then coming to the final part of what can we do to keep these, these sensible? And the honest answer falls into three categories. Good maintenance, knowing what is valuable and what is noise, and turning off the noise proactively. The next one is making sure that your tools and your systems are optimized for scalability. So you do not want a human looking at every single logon message. It, it's, it would cause someone to go mad. Oh, There's okay. so many messages, you just don't want to look at it. Right. What you want to be able to do is you want to be able to group those together collectively, gather the alerts, gather the events, and try and turn them into incidents using automation. So we build analytics engines, and we build data mining, and we build uh, threat hunting processes and activities to find better ways of pushing these alerts into consumable knowledge into consumable triggers for activity and that's that's really key that's where the security industry is constantly innovating and constantly trying to solve this problem and there's no there's no perfect solution i mean in some cases if if you ask me some security questions the answer is oh well you want a firewall or yes put it in the dmz very definitive security as a service is still very much evolving and so i don't know of anybody in the market who has solved this outright and there's everyone obviously claims they have but i don't know of anyone who probably has from our perspective, what we do internally at Sigilant, we aim to um, balance that alert volume because we're trying to augment humans rather than replace them. And that's a strategic difference. If I um, <laughs> mention names of some of our, uh, some of our colleagues in the industry, um, an awful lot of efforts put in to try and remove the human from the analysis process as part of security monitoring. That is, I fundamentally believe, and it's not protectionism, I fundamentally believe that will result in failure. What we should be trying to do as an industry is trying to use machine learning, trying to use data mining and data science techniques to focus the analysts, to cut down the noise they have to look at, to cut down the noise the customers have to look at. So a perfect example, if you have a really good um, machine learning algorithm, it is able to watch and learn your logon behaviors for all of your users. And that means that it knows, all right, that's, that's Joe Murphy. Joe Murphy logs on normally between these hours. Therefore, anything outside of that, well, that's one maybe someone wants to go and look at. Joe, why did you log on at three o'clock in the morning from uh, Nicaragua? Yeah. It doesn't, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't make sense. So that, that's an alert we can look at. Now, if I look at, um, again, former lives and even current lives to some extent, uh, we look at a weekly log on report and we're trying to pick that Joe Murphy, Nicaragua, out of the pile. That, start, that takes analyst time. It, it causes burnout. And particularly from a SOC perspective, we try to reduce throwing that at customers. Um, and then it is something I'm aware of happens in the industry a lot is uh, <laughs> internally speaking, analysts start to burn out and then they just start to throw more and more at the customer's direction. And then th that has a knock-on effect. It, it's actually negative. So really from the perspective of how we avoid snow blindness, summarizing, Make sure you keep your environment tuned. Keep the noise down. Make sure you use your automation and make sure you use the tools that you have to keep the relevant alerts at the top. And then finally, sort of a, a, another partial one is to separate out different types of alerts between the someone needs to go and do something and more advisory type alerts. And that's something that, again, a lot of the... Um, other people in the community aren't so good at because a lot of it's automated. Uh, they will send a thousand, two thousand alerts, but half of them might be something saying, look, we think you're using default administrative accounts. No one needs to get out of bed at three o'clock in the morning. No one needs to review this on an ongoing basis. What we're going to do is we're going to collect all of these together and we're going to create a single, you mentioned earlier, security journey ticket which is one, one thing and we're going to put that on your long-term development list and our CSA is going to work with you on that. That's a sigilant sort of specific element. That's how we handle it. But in the industry at large, there's no particularly good way that I've seen globally of doing this. And that's, that's sad to see because it, it should be a solved problem. It just isn't. So hopefully that'll give some insights in the different ways we can control that alert volume. Because at the end of the day, I think 
um, we're, we're moving towards uh, some new features and um, just check the attendee list. <laughs> yeah, product management aren't on the call, so I'm safe. <laughs> um, so, so on that, uh, <laughs> we're, we're going to be releasing some new features which give us uh, some new reporting tools. And those reporting tools are really focused on customer cus customizable reports. And so we talk about our customers, um, but there's so many different types of customer that we're going to be able to customize that reporting structure for each different archetype. And one of them being the entry level customer and an entry level customer who's trying to get their business off the ground, <laughs> who's busy uh, trying to deal with investors and deal, deal with new technologies of their own. Um, they don't maybe have five hours a week or 10 hours a week. So that's more about showing them what's there and highlighting urgent risks. Whereas somebody take it five years down the line, who's uh, pretty much got their cybersecurity together. Uh, at that point, we're talking about, right, well, here's a compliance that you should probably go for. And here's some changes that you can make. So that again, feeds into the alert volume. We try and just take off the cream of the alerts, the top 10, the things that customers have capability to deal with, and then work through those on an ongoing basis. So hopefully that gives you some, some, some of the answer you asked for. And you didn't stop me talking, so I assume that wasn't too long. No, no. So there's, there's a big issue, Ben, with trying to justify the cost of security monitoring yeah. internally by an outside vendor. So there's, there's one question on here that I want to talk about, uh, which is like, what, what software and tools do I need? But mm. I think... You know, this this is more about you know SOC as a service. Let's let's talk about how one would justify the cost. I envision you know a small IT team chasing their tail, drinking from a fire hose, just struggling to keep up with all the noise. And yeah. you know maybe they're afraid to you know go to their boss and say, hey, I I can't do this alone. I need help, mm -hmm. right? And then you got to think about bringing in a full time employee. The cost. I'm gonna Turn it over to you before I start answering the question. You're the expert. <laughs> well, I, I, I different opinions, so I'll try and give a fair a fair view of all of them. Um, the first one is that security as a service vendors uh, very quickly. Whenever we start talking to a new organization, we, we we will frequently find the mindset from their current IT teams and current security teams that this is a replacement for them, or this is a somehow a negative reflection on their performance. That is absolutely never the case never the case um and it's also fair to say that every team i've ever met in a technical field outside of outside of government and government have all the resources they need generally but outside of government pretty much every team i've ever come across is under resourced um that is the nature of the technical world and uh, it's an ongoing challenge for us in the technical fields to deal with that but where we come in is that if you look at trying to build a dedicated security monitoring function, you've got to make some hard decisions pretty early. And you could say either we're going to have someone sitting in a chair 24 seven, three, six, five, just to watch for the alerts coming in and react. And you say that, okay, so what's that going to take? You can't staff 24 seven, three, six, five with any less than four or five people because people need to sleep. People need holidays. It's really 24 hours in a day, but most people only work for eight of them. So, you need about four or five people and you can't take the most junior uh, either college grads or people who are, are maybe coming in through a, an educational work program. You have to take people who actually know what they're doing because if an alarm goes off at 3 a.m., their escalation options are limited. Um, do they ring the director of IT and say, hi, we have an issue here? Well, the director of IT probably doesn't woken up at three o'clock in the morning every night. So that, that, that can be a real challenge to get the right people. And there is, a, I mean, I didn't read the US numbers, but I know the UK has got something like, 500,000 open we're, IT security roles right now? We're not close behind. The last I saw was like 250,000, and that seems small. Yeah, huge, huge number of open roles for security professionals. And um, because it is, I mean, security as a field, as an actual profession, and um, there's always been people who've done security, but as a mainstream profession, it's really only starting to come into fruition now. So yeah. you've got to go and find five people. Not, not, not top tier necessarily, but certainly not bottom tier. So five tier middle of the road people, let's say you're talking salaries in the 90 to 100K range, and you've got five of them, <laughs> you're into half a mil just on five people. Now, unfortunately, employees, well, 
they tend to be needy at times. <laughs> as an employee, I'm needy at times as well. And, and they're going to need desks and they're going to need laptops and they're going to need basic onboarding. So that, that's not just your hiring cost, that, that, that's your across the board employee cost. You could be into a, mil, a million already. Now, on a wider level then, you asked, you, you were mentioning tools earlier, which I think you want to ask a separate question on. But look, whenever you then think about it, if you throw a load of the most talented people in a room by themselves with no tooling, uh, they have two choices. They can spend all their time building tooling and a roll your own solution is certainly it's, it's happened and it works, um, but it's a lot more challenging to do that. And you have now built a system that you need to maintain where there's no support line because you build it in-house. There's no one you can go and talk to. It's just, there's just you and your team. And as you start to move people on, the knowledge about that system will start to be lost as well because it's not standard. It's a, it, it's a custom roll your own. So by the time all told, some security teams have got budgets in the order of a million, two million to set up and tool them properly for, for, for medium to large organizations. And that's a pretty big bill straight out of the gates. Pretty big bill. So instead, sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> I knew I brought this for a reason. I knew that was coming for a while. Yeah, I'm <laughs> talking too much today. So if you're talking about security as a service, that is the classic outsourcing model, but you're not fully outsourcing all of your security aspects. All you're doing is taking the fact that you need someone to keep watch 24 seven. And that's where we can come in. Mm -hmm. Now that, that's the baseline package. That's the entry level whereby we will be able to be that person who's sitting there 24 seven watching your environment. And if something urgent happens, yeah, we're going to ring you at three o'clock in the morning and wake you up. If something happens that it's an advisory, let's say we see some unusual behavior, but nothing on the tail end of it. It's just, Hey, it's unusual. That person's logged in. Yeah. They, they don't normally log in. Um, they're not doing anything suspicious. They're not, they're not trying to scan other systems. They're not, they're not doing anything particularly nefarious. So we'll, we'll put a watch on it, but we're not going to wake you up at three o'clock in the morning. We'll send you an email for the next morning and let you deal with that. Um, and further down the line as well, as I say, an additional services that we offer. Um, if in your environment we start to see things like security advisories, default accounts being used, weak passwords being used, um, security policies, using old versions of things, patch management, patch servers that aren't up to date, all of those sorts of things we'll start to gather. And that lets our security advisors build a, a picture of your environment. And then we can start on our monthly calls, not just saying, hello, you've had 12,000 alerts this month and they were of type A and type B and type C. I mean, you can see that yourself. You don't need us to tell you. Um, but what we can do is we can say, look, we've picked a few of these and see these ones. We notice you're still using Telnet, for example. And you shouldn't be. That's it's a bad thing to do. stop. What can we do to help you? I mean, it, it, what's it used in? What are the con what are the configurations? What why is it needed? Can we replace it with SSH? Those are the sorts of things we can start to have conversations about. And this all comes down to I'm going to go way off script now. This all comes down to one of the reasons why I think a lot of security as a service vendors do flood their customers in alerts and, and incidents. And the reason is because. It's actually in, in the security industry quite hard to demonstrate value. It's hard for us to prove we're doing work for you. And the reason is because it, it's, it's like insurance. Um, yeah. I, I, I say it's like insurance, to be really clear. It's like it, it's not the same as insurance. You're paying money in case something happens. Security as a service, you should be getting service even if nothing is happening. And that's really one of our key differentiators. So if your environment is quiet, if you have been a good internet citizen, you've done all your patches, you haven't got any out of date stuff, you're not letting people in your network, you're properly following your processes and all your procedures are nice and shiny, your compliance is up to date. Well then there's no point in me trying to prove I'm doing work for you by sending you a thousand words a day. But what, I, what I'll do instead is I'll go, all right, you need to know about the important stuff. So these are the 10 alerts a day, the five alerts a day that you do need to know about because here you've got an open port here. Someone's gone and set up a server, like a Kubernetes cluster somewhere that you don't know about because let's be honest, engineers can be creative and they can go and build their own worlds when they need to. So that's the stuff you need to know about. Other than, other than times then, so if you have unusual logon patterns, we'll, we'll create a report and we'll talk about it once a month. If we find that you've got compliance issues that aren't right now a problem, we'll talk about that during our, during our monthly calls. We'll even, I mean, we do things such as customer health checks. That's just an environment-wide deep dive. We do things such as threat hunts. So for example, we've occasionally in the past couple of months, it, 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 very different world with COVID-19, but um, in the past couple of months, we've seen situations where some customers have been breached. We've been on the phone to them within 10 minutes telling them, um, I'll, I'll pick one example where it was a malware infection 
and it was a process of trying to encrypt their entire server infrastructure. Uh, we, we caught it pretty quickly, and I think in total there were three servers affected out of about 30 or 40. So that, that was a success story. But what we then did is we looked at the malware and went, oh, hang on. It's been quite methodical. We think we have other customers who could be vulnerable to this. So we then went and did a deep dive of five or six other customers who it's, they were running a particular piece of software that was vulnerable. And we knew that, so we were able to go and look at those customers as well, do a threat hunt on those customers, and proactively tell those customers, hey, look, we know there's something happening, you are vulnerable to it. And as a result, we think you should proactively do this or this or this for their circumstance, customize a solution and a mitigation for them. And in one case, um, it's difficult to say this definitively, we are pretty sure, pretty sure we caught an attempt in progress. As in, they, they were in the process of blocking it and moving some things into a DMZ, whenever a particular server went down with a, uh, it, the malware didn't complete encrypting, so it just mangled the disk, but we're pretty sure we caught it in action proactively. And that, that, that's, that is security value. That's how you demonstrate value. You don't demonstrate it just by throwing thousands of alerts because it just turns into snow blindness. Yep. That's the true definition of customer security value. So well, the ter term, I, I would love to change that term. And I'm sorry, I'd love to change the term to add the word demonstrable in front of it. Oh yeah. But Every piece of value that you, I mean, gone are the days, and well, I'm happy they're gone. Gone are the days where uh, vendors can say, don't worry, we're doing loads of work for you. We've done loads. I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but we honestly, we've done loads. No, that's gone. It needs, it needs to be very clear. It needs to be, and the way you find this word, it should be a proper partnership. Mm -hmm. So look, here's the work we're doing. And we have customers as well who, they have very specific needs. So they're, they're, buying a secure, they're buying the core of the security monitoring service. But on the other hand, they're coming to us and saying, look, see all of the alerts and all this entire area of the network. We don't care. We literally don't care. So don't look at those. Don't give us any alerts. Don't tell us anything about that because we don't care. And to give some background on this, this is um, test networks. So it's a large, wide open test network that is used by academic students to test software. So it is riddled with malware. It is full of problems. They don't care. It's a DMZ. Wow. And, and the, well, the, the reason they don't care is it's all deep freeze. So that means whenever you switch a machine off and switch it back on again, it's almost like a hardware reset. So it, they don't care. It'll get infected all day and all night. And then at midnight every night, it just goes and it's back to factory settings. But on the other hand, they have other areas that they want us to do specific activities for. So they're very, very intensely keen on audit controls for user activity. So those are examples of focusing our customer uh, service delivery as to exactly what it is they want. Um, but it also speaks volumes to dem demonstrable customer security value because we can demonstrate doing what it is is valuable to that customer. And if we can't demonstrate it, again, similar to security monitoring, nobody's watching. What's the point of creating the alert? Yep. Love that. All right. So Ben, thank you for that. That was excellent. And I hope uh, a lot of the questions were answered. We, we have some time left, you guys. Uh, ben, there are some questions that we didn't get to, but I feel like we went on an awesome uh, tangent. And uh, I feel like we addressed a lot of these. Now, you're looking at the same list as me. Is there any of these that you feel like we need to shed a little more light on? Um, I, again, I, I wasn't reading the list as I was talking, but I think we have covered quite a lot of those. Um, yeah. I know that we have a few sort of Q&A type questions coming in as well, so I'm cautious I want to leave a bit of time for those. Um, yeah, I'm pretty, sure, I'm pretty sure we've covered most of those. Pretty sure we've covered those questions. All right, well, let's, <clears throat> let's take these last you know, 10, 15 minutes or so, open it up to the audience for questions. Um, <clears throat> I know people can be a little shy using the, you can either use the Q&A feature or the chat. But if there's anything that you, know, you would like to run by Ben, now's the time. Um, can also follow up after but <clears throat> everyone in attendance today will receive a copy of the webinar uh, the recording will also be available for on demand uh, on our youtube channel um but yeah then i think you know we'll give it a minute <clears throat> do you want to um add some light on you know any specific you i love how you talked about the educational uh environment because they have to have a crazy network because learning can't stop or they wouldn't be in business yeah. so i'm particularly interested and i think this might be a side panel conversation but like what about what about medical hospitals 
Mm. They must have, you know, they must have the hardest time securing all that stuff. You know, like like educational hospitals, um, hospitals. The the hardest environment that I've ever had to work in or ever had to deal with w- was actually academic. And I, I know what you're saying about hospitals having a problem, but the reason academic and it was specifically in the cybersecurity field. So it was um, a customer who was a university, um, UK based, and they had a very active cybersecurity program. They are attracting worldwide students and candidates to learn and to, to be taught there. And many of them were very talented. And so their network was just a battleground, endless battleground. That, that, that's been one of the most challenging environments because <laughs> you're teaching a lecture on cross site scripting, and then that <laughs> night, yeah. Literally, the university public facing website just gets blasted and it, it, it lines up to the course syllabus so that they know the students are actively attacking the university. And now, thankfully, I'm, I'm a friend of, uh, friend of a friend who actually works in their IT department. And he said that actually it, it's kind, it's not, it's not discouraged or encouraged. They see it as positive, the fact that the guys are actually coming up with some really novel attacks and they are happy that nobody has, done, has ever actually when they compromise something, they've never actually maliciously destroyed it. So generally speaking, everyone is a relatively good citizen. Now that, 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 that's definitely been one of the most challenging because it's a perfect storm. It's a very wide open environment and you're teaching people how to break it in the middle of it. So that's kind of a special case. Coming back to your question about medical. Yeah. One of the biggest challenges there is risk and uh, medical I would almost say you've, you have another perfect storm there of risks. Some organizations are kind of data driven. If you take lawyers, they've got loads and loads of data. Generally not much access to cash, not much access to physical, but loads of very, very sensitive data. And that is their business. So if they are compromised, their business is done. Now, in if I take a different example. The Panama. Um, and in, sorry? You remember the Panama Papers breach that that uh, yes, yes, yes. And well, I know, I know again, some solicitors who've gone back to paper. So mm-hmm. literally I, I made some property purchases and they've gone back to paper. They don't keep any files on connected network computers anymore. Um, that's just their now very traditional uh, lead partner. And they just said, no, nope, no computers. That's it. Done. Nothing. You're allowed, you're allowed standalone computers, but nothing that connects to a network. And uh, that, that's how I handled it. But come, again, come back to your medical. If you look at um, industrial environments where you've got giant machines, and I think we're talking about scary places <laughs> that I've been working, uh, writing software for a steelworks, and I think it was Minnesota somewhere, and you're talking about a piece of software that controls a 50, 50 60 ton bucket of molten steel, and you're writing about a code that decides if it's going to tip or not. And then on a wider level, that's from a security perspective. Someone gets in there, they are controlling a 50 ton bucket of molten steel with uh, loads and loads and loads of very, very brave men and women working around it. So that you've got lives at risk with the machines that you're interfacing to. And then taking it a step further, banking. Um, Customer data, yes, to a degree, but mostly it's financial. If you get access to account transactions, you can start making them. And so you have you've different areas of risk. If you take it to a hospital, you've typically, they're, they're, they are handling finances and payments. They have payment details. They have confidential medical records and they have access, they have machines on there that are keeping people alive. So that is a, again, a very, very high risk environment. And in terms of protecting that, um, different strategies and techniques are used. Um, one of the key ones is segregation. So uh, any good hospital, uh, I need to be careful. I'm not entirely sure who all of our guests are. Um, so I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I apologize if anyone work in the medical sector. A hospital should segregate all healthcare from records and segregate all records from financial. It should almost be not just a firewall in between, it should be a physical separation. So no medical device should be networked or networkable. And I know that's a, that's a challenge for connected healthcare, which is starting to push the boundaries of that. Um, I would consider myself to be a, a security purist. The only way to say you're safe is to make sure there's no connection. Now, I know, again, connected health is becoming a major item. But if you're talking about a respirator, or you're talking about, particularly in these times, breathing apparatus, you don't want that networked. I don't think. 
So the, the challenge there would, is, is really to segregate your network in a way that your most valuable assets are inaccessible publicly and externally. Absolutely. Then you want to put security monitoring in place to look for any kind of connections or look for any attempts or attacks or, or anything surrounding that in um, almost an isolated way. So you can create, uh, particularly again with some of our collectors, it's possible for you to create like a one-way tap. So you can not inject anything into the network, but you can read everything on it. So you can start to monitor that network in the knowledge that even if someone compromised your monitor, you can't inject back onto the network. And then you layer, your, you layer your network and risks behind that, whereby you've got all of your critical infrastructure right in the center, heavily protected. All of those nodes are registered and monitored by security vendor and your own team in partnership. You've then got outside of that patient records and then financial, I think, probably comes last. And although I'm not suggesting financial isn't important, if somebody compromises your system and states credit card numbers, you know what your limit of risk is and you're insured against that. If somebody steals medical records, believe the consequences are substantially higher and those are the most <clears throat> valuable on the dark web right yeah um if particularly i mean there's an awful lot of uh lot of challenge right now in fact i'll tell you a side story i was reading this week that somebody was able to write a prediction algorithm by using private flight pattern details from corporate private jets to predict mergers and acquisitions Wow. Global mergers and acquisitions were predictable based upon the flight routes of corporate owned private jets. So they, they compromised a database that was able to de anonymize those flight numbers. And then they were able to say, right, they're going to buy them, they're going to merge with them, they're going to. And if you know that, like you're, you're not in the stock market and you're saying, wow, okay, I can now short those and I can buy those and so on and so forth. Medical records as well. If you, for example, find out that the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, who's been in charge for five, 10 years, driving up success after success after success, and you find they have, they have cancer, you, you now have a fair, a fair way to say, well, I think if they're the one driving the success, they're gonna hit tough times in the next X months. Or worse still, if you're able to then hold that record and blackmail, say, hey, look, we know what this is gonna do to your share price. So either pay us, or we're gonna short a whole load of your stock and then release this. So yes, definitely targetable. Every time we speak, Joe, I feel that you have a look in your face that goes slightly more panicked and slightly more concerned, so I'm sorry. I'm just glad that you're on my team, so that's all I have to say to that. <laughs> Despite the hat being black, I am very much a white hat, yeah. Yeah, I know. You're a good guy, Ben. Uh, well, you know, I think that uh, we're, we're coming up on the 45 minutes, yeah. so it's probably safe to wrap it up. Or... Oh, sorry, I was just going to say that another question came in there. Um, oh, yeah. Um, uh, sorry, specifically the question, more, more or less in summary, just someone asking about our opinion on the, the Windows 10 vulnerability that was released. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm copy pasting from previous weeks. Uh, the response to most vulnerabilities is, is the same, which is make sure you keep your patching and your vulnerability management system up to date. So any, anybody who has an active patching regime doesn't really need to worry about this because they'll have patched it out already. If you don't, then yes, you need to be a lot more concerned. And the number one thing, I mean, you, you could run around your, your environment or your office, or given we're all working from home, you could run around all your employees' homes trying to find all the vulnerable laptops, or you can just get a patch management solution in place. That, 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 that's a better option. Um, and that protects you against this and the next one. And I had my uh, six monthly audit email from our, from our internal, from our CISO, checking that my patch management is up to date. And that's sort of demonstration we, we practice what we preach. But in, in general, there is an endless stream of vulnerabilities, an endless stream of attacks. The best way to deal with them is just keep current, keep patched. It's not, um, it's not something you do once a year. It's something that you need a system in place to keep you up to date all of the time. And if you have problems patching specific servers or systems, that needs to feed into your seam and then into your remote monitoring. And if, <clears throat> if you're struggling to keep up with all the things that Ben just mentioned, you know, I like to close all of these webinars with this, is that just know that there are companies out there that are, exist to help you. So you do not have to walk your cybersecurity journey alone, right? There's companies out there like Sigilant who will have your back 24 seven, 365, you know, assuring that there's eyes on glass. A human being is 
monitoring your environment 24-7, 365, allowing you to focus on all of the other tasks that you have on your plate. So with that, Ben, I'll um, wrap it up. I want to thank you very, very much for your excellent insight, as always. And once again, uh, attendees, keep a lookout for a copy of the recording. And any questions that you have, feel free to send them our way. We'll get them answered for you. Excellent. All right, Ben. Well, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Everyone, thank same you. to you. Take care. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Until next time. Bye.